This video is about the hierarchy of values developed by the philosopher Max Scheler in the early 20th century. His hierarchy is an attempt to capture the way that values are ordered in our very experience of them, rather than an attempt to impose order on them from outside based on some abstract conception. Now this doesn't mean that he succeeded or succeeded perfectly, and there may be aspects of this that you disagree with, but Shaler's aim was to highlight and clarify what our own experience tells us. And this is a helpful enterprise because, once the inherent structure of values is clarified, we can better pursue what is most worthwhile and, as far as possible, rightly balance the demands of different areas of life. Although you see a little preview of the hierarchy on this slide, I won't explain it fully until the end of the video. First, I'll talk about the approach that Shaler takes, and then how he uses this to reach the conclusions he does, to produce this particular ordering of values. Max Shaler was a German philosopher who lived between 1874 and 1928. Born into a Jewish family, he converted to Catholicism in the 1910s, then later left the church and distanced himself from religion in the 1920s. I mention this because values and religion are closely intertwined. You may see the influence of Christianity in his philosophy of value, and it's certainly true that he's been a big influence on modern Christian philosophy, particularly within Catholicism. In fact, Pope John Paul II wrote his doctoral dissertation on Shaler's ethical system. Shaler was a phenomenological philosopher and is best known for applying phenomenology to the realm of ethics and value, one of the results of which was his hierarchy of the different value modalities. To put it simply, phenomenology is an approach to philosophy that focuses on experience. It examines the structure of experience itself as it is given to us bracketing other considerations such as whether the objects of our experience are ultimately subjective or objective, real or unreal. When examining value, this means carefully noticing what is given in the experiences of value themselves, rather than trying to work out morality or aesthetics in the abstract. Because whatever abstract theory we develop must, in any case, be confirmed by our moral or aesthetic intuitions in order to be considered convincing, relevant, or true. So rather than taking this roundabout approach, Shaler suggests, let's go straight to the phenomena, to the experiences of value, and see what they have to say. It may be that they have a richness, an order, and a consistency all their own. Shaler wrote the book that outlines his philosophy of value in two installments, the first part appearing in 1913, and the second in 1916. He wrote it in the midst of his Christian period. Its title is translated as Formalism in Ethics and Non-Formal Ethics of Values. Sometimes that last part is rendered as Material Ethics of Values, which means essentially the same thing. By the way, the edition I'm using, and which I'll be quoting from, is the translation by Manfred S. Frings, and Roger L. Funk, published by Northwestern University Press in 1973. And as far as I know, this is the only English translation that has been published. All page numbers will be from this edition. Within the philosophical discipline of ethics, this book is considered a chief example of material value ethics. Material value ethics can be distinguished from other ethical theories by its emphasis on values, on the a priori as opposed to the a posteriori and on the non-formal or material as opposed to the formal. I'll explain each of these characteristics in turn. The primary focus of material value ethics is, somewhat unsurprisingly, values. Values in general, rather than only certain values or certain types of values. Other theories have other, more specific focuses, for example, in deontological ethics, the concept of duty is central. In utilitarian ethics, practical consequences in terms of pleasure or happiness are the most important moral considerations. And in virtue ethics, the virtues are the most important. It's important to note that value ethics doesn't exclude these. 
Each are, after all, ethical phenomena, and each have ethical relevance. When one considers the potential consequences of one's actions, or when one behaves uh, based on duty, in both these cases one is engaging with value. Likewise with virtue ethics. Virtues, the habits of behavior that make a person excellent or good, these are phenomena of value and exist among other kinds of value. The value of an individual good act by an unvirtuous person, for instance, or the value of duty in general. By focusing on the basic phenomena of value, which underpin all ethical theories, material value ethics can, perhaps, include them all within itself. For material value ethics, ethics is understood a priori, rather than a posteriori. That is to say, its truths can be known immediately, without first looking at the world to figure out whether they are really the case or not. This is an old dichotomy in philosophy that Shaler puts his own phenomenological spin on. He describes it in this way. We designate as a priori all those ideal units of meaning and those propositions that are self-given by way of an immediate intuitive content in the absence of any kind of positing of subjects that think them and of the real nature of those subjects and in the absence of any kind of positing of objects to which such units of meaning are applicable. As per Shaler's definition, whatever is immediately given within an experience is known a priori, even when the experience is of something unreal or illusory. He gives the following example to illustrate this. In those cases in which we deceive ourselves, for example by taking something to be alive when it is not, the intuited essence of life must be given in the whole of the constituent elements of the deception. Whether a particular thing I see is alive or not can be established a posteriori, after positing a whole outside world of individual beings and my own individual mind which interacts with them in a certain way. But the essence of life, the sense or meaning of what life is, is given immediately and is therefore known a priori. The essence of life does not become non-life or something else if the particular thing I saw proves to be inanimate. Typically, the a priori, a posteriori distinction is described in terms of knowledge before or after experience. But for Shaler, this is the wrong way to put it. For him, all is experience, even logic and mathematics are based on the experience of intuitive insight into their truths. So instead of experience versus non-experience, he says on page 52, we are concerned with two kinds of experience, pure and immediate experience, and the experience conditioned and mediated by positing the natural organization of a real bearer of acts. Again, a posteriori knowledge is based on positing a self and world that is a certain way, outside of the immediate experience. Shaler says a posteriori knowledge is gained through a series of observations which is in principle endless of this posited world, or in other words through induction, the way that science gradually accumulates knowledge through repeated observations. A process in principle endless because it always remains possible for one new observation to break the pattern. This is a mediated and incremental process, but a priori knowledge is direct and instantaneous. I know a particular shade of red as soon as I first experience it, even if I know nothing about light waves or eyes. Shaler calls the kind of awareness in which we are focused on the a priori contents of our experience, he calls this phenomenological experience, and on pages 50 to 51 he distinguishes it from everyday non-phenomenological experience in the following two ways. Firstly, it alone yields facts themselves and hence immediately. To return to the example of red, there's a thousand different things I could say to designate this color. For example, the color of this thing here, or a certain surface, or the color with a specific perspective position within a color spectrum, or that light which has a particular wavelength. But none of these give me red itself. For someone who had never seen red, they would be useless. 
All these non-phenomenological approaches to the color red point to and are grounded upon what can only be given in the phenomenological experience, the actual color red. It honors, says Shayla, all the bills of exchange on which the other experiences draw. The second characteristic of non-phenomenological experience is that it is imminent. This is related to what I said previously about the a priori not being dependent on positing, that is, on assuming other things beyond the experience. In non-phenomenological experience, Shayla says, experience transcends its intuitional content as is the case in the natural perception of real things. In this kind of experience, something that is not given in it is meant. Phenomenological experience, however, contains no separation between what is meant and what is given. In everyday non-phenomenological experience, an objective external world is meant, but not given. If it were given, we would not need science to gradually find out about it, and more fundamentally, we would not be able to doubt it. Shaler rejects an a posteriori approach to ethics and value. We cannot learn what is valuable through observation, in the way we can learn more about the physical laws of the natural world. We can't say, for example, that the valuable is whatever most people do most of the time. This will only get us to certain facts about what people do, certain regularities and patterns of how things happen to be. Even if everyone did things in exactly the same way, this wouldn't get us closer to a genuine knowledge of value. The phenomena of value are basic in the way that the color red or the concept of life are basic. We would first need to understand value in order to interpret this consistent pattern of action among all people as valuable or valuing, rather than just a curious but consistent pattern of action among all people. The fact that in practice, access to value phenomena is acquired during a process of observation and instruction doesn't negate this. Mathematics and logic also need to be taught, illustrated with examples and so forth. They are clearly a priori because after access to them is gained, they are self-evident. Whereas the laws of physics are never self-evident, but entirely dependent upon how the world posited by non-phenomenological experience actually happens to be. Now we come to the next distinction between formal and non-formal or material, material being the opposite to formal as in form versus matter. On page 53, Shayla says that while the distinction between a priori and a posteriori is absolute, being founded in the variety of contents that fulfill concepts and propositions, on the other hand, the distinction between formal and non-formal is completely relative and at the same time related only to concepts and propositions with respect to their universality. In other words, the formal non-formal distinction relates to how general a concept or proposition is in its application. Logic is perhaps the most basic of all as it appears to apply to everything that A is B and a is not B, cannot both be true in the same way at the same time, this can be known regardless of what exactly A and B represent. Likewise, mathematics is highly formal, though a little less so than logic. 2 times 2 equals 4 is true, regardless of whether we're talking about plums or pears. The philosopher Immanuel Kant, who Shayla both reveres and refutes, held that ethics is fundamentally formal. At least, that is the prevailing view, and it's certainly what Shaler believed to be Kant's position. According to this ethical formalism, in order to arrive at ethical action, we must only apply an abstract rule of, or principle. Kant would say we must apply the categorical imperative. One formulation of this is, act only according to that maxim, whereby you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. Another formulation is, act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never merely as a means to an end, but always at the same time as an end. It's clear that any act in any situation can fit into these. 
If the way I intend to act would result in a contradiction if I turned this act into a rule and applied it to everyone, then I shouldn't act that way. Likewise, if my action would use someone merely as a means to something else, then again, I shouldn't do it. Therefore, for instance, I should never lie, because allowing everyone to lie would lead to a world where no one could ever be believed. The basic reliability of communication would break down, violating the first formulation of the categorical imperative. Likewise, lying to someone is clearly treating them as a means rather than respecting them as an end, allowing them to decide what to do or believe, thus violating the second formulation. Lying is therefore always wrong, no matter when, where, to whom, about what, or how, because it violates these formal criteria. For Kant, this even means that lying to save an innocent life is not permissible. Because this approach is so general and rigid, because it is so formal, it leads to paradoxes where ordinary moral intuition conflicts starkly with what the theory says is right. Material value ethics avoids this problem because it focuses on the relatively non-formal value phenomena themselves and their particular interconnections. Most of us know, as a matter of continual experience, that ethics isn't as simple as the application of a universal rule. Rather, its demands seem to vary with who we are, who or what we are interacting with, the specific situation we are in, and countless other factors. It seems to have its subtle degrees and levels. Something is better than another thing, but a third is better still. It does not seem to be merely an exercise of rationality and application of a rule, but involves being emotionally drawn toward or torn between particular outcomes or values. All these details of experience are relatively non-formal, but by no means unimportant, as in the example of lying to save an innocent life. Material value ethics attends to the non-formal details. We can understand that we can't have adequate knowledge of a specific shade of red until it is experienced. We can also understand that certain rational truths, those for instance of mathematics and logic, must be basic or self-evident. We just know them, can't break them down any further. But what about the phenomena of value? There has been a tendency in philosophy to reduce the human being to a combination of thinking and perception, but Shaler maintains that the intuition and cognition of values and their interconnections comes from neither of these. Instead, on page 68 he says, this cognition occurs in special functions and acts which are toto kylo, that is totally, different from all perception and thinking. These functions and acts supply the only possible access to the world of values. This doesn't just mean observing your own mind, rather values and their order flash before us in the felt and lived affair with world, be it psychic, physical or whatever, in preferring and rejecting, in loving and hating, i.e in the course of performing such intentional functions and acts. If we were limited only to thinking and perception, he notes, we would be completely blind to values. So far I've been talking about the approach that Shaler takes. I'll now talk about how he applies this approach to establish the order among values. This begins at page 81 of the book. First of all, he discusses relatively formal essential interconnections. These are highly general truths akin to logic, a sort of logic of value. For example, the fact that all values are either positive or negative, that the existence of a positive value is itself a positive value, the existence of a negative value itself a negative value, the non-existence of a positive value itself a negative value, that a positive value ought to be, and so on. These formal interconnections are indispensable for understanding value phenomena. They're the basic structure in which values are experienced, yet they cannot give us any concrete guidance about what to do, what to choose. Next he discusses how values relate to their bearers. 
Values are distinct from their bearers. For example, if a particular person is good, that person himself is not the very essence of goodness. He is a bearer of the value of goodness. Likewise, if something is uncomfortable, it is not discomfort itself. Different values pertain to different types of bearer. Ethical values pertain to persons. We cannot meaningfully use the term good in its fullest moral sense in reference to an object or animal. Likewise, vital values pertain to all living things, humans included. Values of agreeableness and use pertain to things and events. While we might consider some people agreeable or useful, this isn't in respect of their being persons. On page 86, Shayla says, As soon as we tend to objectify a human being in any way, the bearer of moral values disappears of necessity. I referred before to Shayla's position that values are encountered through special acts and functions totally different from thinking and perception. One such act is preferring. On page 87, Shayla explains, the fact that one value is higher than another is apprehended in a special act of value cognition, the act of preferring. He is clear that the relative height of the values is apprehended in the encounter with them through the very act of preferring. Preferring is not something that is done after the values are encountered, a kind of post hoc assessment. Shaler is also clear that preferring is not merely choosing between two values. He notes, preferring occurs in the absence of all conation, choosing and willing, and uses the example of saying, I prefer roses to carnations. This happens without any sense of a choice being made. We just know what we like and we say it. Preferring is thus somewhat akin to perception, in the sense that I do not choose what I see, but see whatever is there. Likewise, in the very act of preferring a value, its relative height is manifest to me. However, this doesn't mean that there aren't any deceptions of preferring. Preferring can be deceived, just as our ordinary perception can be deceived, for example, by optical illusions. Shaler notes that preferring can concern the goods in which values are instantiated, or can directly concern the values themselves, and it does not require multiple values to be clearly present to awareness, to, as it were, judge between them. Shaler uses a couple of examples. If I feel a given deed is preferable to others, I do not need to mentally picture the other deeds I could do. All that is necessary is the consciousness of being able to prefer something else that accompanies the act. This is especially obvious when an act of preferring is most definitive, where there has not intervened any sense of confusion or hesitation. In this case, the height of the value is given with the utmost degree of evidence. We are as convinced as we can be about its preferability, though only the preferred value or good was given. Shaler says that in order to apprehend the relative height of a value, only a consciousness of direction of the other possible values is required, not their factual givenness to awareness. Preferring may, however, occur where there is a degree of confusion or hesitation. It may be clearly conscious and accompanied by deliberation between multiple values given to feeling, or it may occur automatically so that we are hardly aware of this activity at all, a kind of instinctive preferring. Since all day, every day, we are effectively preferring certain things to others as we navigate the world, this latter kind of preferring is especially important. However, in both cases, the act of preferring is essentially the same. I mentioned that the height of values is apprehended in the encounter with them through the act of preferring. There is a more profound aspect to this. On page 89, Shayla says that, since all values stand essentially in an order of ranks, i.e. since all values are, in relation to each other, higher or lower, and since these relations are comprehensible only in preferring or rejecting them, the feeling of values has its foundation by essential necessity in preferring and placing after. That is to say, preferring and placing after are the primary acts in the encounter with values. 
I'll talk about placing after in a minute. The point here is that we don't first feel values as though neutrally, as though without the equality of height, and then apprehend their height. This would be an, as impossible as feeling a value without its quality of being positive or negative. To be positive or negative is what a value is. Likewise, a value is something lower or higher. Preferring actually gives us access to the very values themselves. On the same page, Shayla remarks, all widening of the value range, for example of an individual, takes place only in preferring and placing after. Only those values which are originally given in these acts can be secondarily felt. Hence, the structure of preferring and placing after circumscribes the value qualities that we feel. If, as I grow, I come to a point where I begin to appreciate spiritual values, beauty, knowledge, righteousness, rather than only vital or sensual values, this is precisely because I have, in some sense, preferred them, apprehended their height, and so obtained access to them. Only afterwards comes the full developed feeling of them. The, values of, the feeling of them would be thwarted if trying to feel them with a mind to which, for example, vital values are still the highest. Whatever I would be feeling in this attempt wouldn't be the genuine spiritual values themselves. Perhaps it would be some kind of distorted caricature of them, knowledge as merely a form of power, for example. But the realm of spiritual values opens up to me if I have a sense that, whatever these values are, they are higher than mere vitality or power or sensual pleasure. Then I have apprehended their most crucial quality and my attention is finally oriented to them in a way that I can feel them more fully. This, at least, is my interpretation of what Shayla means here. Now, one final note, because first I only talked about preferring, but then began to mention both preferring and placing after. This parallels the way Shayla introduces the terms in the book. I take it because he wants you to understand the essence of the act preferring as distinct from other kinds of acts, before the more subtle distinction between preferring and placing after. Here is how he describes the distinction on pages 88 to 89. The height of a value B, in contrast to a value A, can be given in preferring B to A, as well as in the act of placing A after B. Nevertheless, these two methods of apprehending the same relation of value ranks are basically different. In other words, preferring principally affirms the higher value as being higher, while placing after principally denies or denigrates the lower value as being lower. Though the two acts lead to the same rank of values, they each have a different focus or emphasis and can have quite different practical effects. Shaler describes two different types of human being. The critical type, who is principally concerned with denigrating lower values, and the positive type, who is principally concerned with affirming higher values. He remarks, whereas the former strive for virtue by means of a battle against vice, the latter bury and cover vices under newly acquired virtues. Because the height of values is only apprehended in the acts of preferring and placing after, Shaler says, the order of ranks of values can never be deduced or derived. There exist, exists here an intuitive evidence of preference that cannot be replaced by logical deduction. But, he goes on to say, we can and must ask whether or not there are a priori essential interconnections between the higher and lower levels of a value and its other essential properties. In other words, though we cannot logically deduce the height of values based on anything else, we can, once we have directly apprehended their height through the acts of preferring and placing after, we can then observe how other qualities vary with value height. There are five such essential properties that vary with the height of values, though the fifth is the most fundamental and is the ultimate basis of the first four. The first essential property is endurance. This doesn't mean how long the goods that bear these values actually happen to last. Rather, it is an essential quality of the values themselves. 
Specifically, the higher the value, the more enduring it is, the more it is given to our experience as enduring. Here's how Shaler defines this kind of endurance. A value is enduring through its quality of having the phenomenon of being able to exist through time, no matter how long its thing bearer may exist. He uses the example of love of a person. This is given as enduring, as something intrinsically able to endure, regardless of how long it turns out that the love relationship lasts in objective time. That it is able to endure is part of the phenomenon of love, an integral part of the very experience, such that if it was missing, it would not be love that we are feeling. Shayla comments that if we were to say to someone, I love you now, or only for a certain time, that this would clearly be something other than love, since it contradicts the essence of the experience. We can see the variation of endurability with value height in the feelings we experience when engaged with different values. A deep spiritual happiness or bliss is given as extremely enduring. We feel when contemplating magnificent beauty or profound truth, or when absorbed in worship, that this experience must last throughout all changes on other lesser levels of our being. Compare that with a physical pleasure or pain. It is the essence of those experiences to be transient, to quickly change and disappear, though of course they may happen to last a long time. We have no expectation that physical pleasure should last forever, and experience no surprise when it swiftly passes away. The second characteristic could be described as divisibility or extension. Shayla says, values are higher the less they are divisible, that is, the less they must be divided in participation by several. For example, several people can only participate in material goods by dividing them. Material goods instantiate sensual values, they serve our bodily needs and desires food, clothing, building materials, material wealth of all kinds. This has its basis in the fact that sensual values are extensive in their essence, that is to say, extended in space, and the feeling of them is likewise extensive. Shelley uses the example of sugar. The agreeable sweetness of sugar is spread, as it were, all over the sugar, and the feeling it gives rise to is spread across the tongue. As sensual values are inherently involved with space, it is no surprise that their goods must be divided to be shared in by many. We can't both eat the same amount of the same meal. We can't each have the whole length of cloth. We can divide it between us, but then we also divide its value. Half the length of cloth is worth half the value of the whole. However, if we look at higher values in their goods, we see that many people can participate in them without dividing them. Take a great work of art, for example. Any number of people can enjoy it, and enjoy it to the full, without thereby dividing its value or taking from someone else. Lower values, therefore, lead to conflicts of interest, while higher values tend to unite us. The third essential property that varies with value height could be called foundedness. The lower values are founded on the higher values. As Shayla puts it on page 94, a value B is the foundation of a value A if a certain value A can only be given on the condition of the givenness of a certain value B, and this by virtue of an essential lawful necessity. The clearest example of this is the way that the value of the useful is founded on the value of the agreeable. This is because the useful is clearly for the agreeable. We consider something useful if it is, helps establish or maintain something else which is agreeable to us. Without the agreeable, there would be no useful. The very notion of useful contains the idea that it is for something, is the means to some end. But as we'll talk about shortly, the useful is in fact a consecutive value of the agreeable, not a self-value in its own right. Another relationship between values that illustrates the foundedness of one upon the other is the relationship between sensual values and vital values. 
sensual values, for example, pleasure, are founded on vital values, for example, health, strength, nobility, in the sense of vital excellence. We can see this if we consider that life is required to experience and appreciate sensual values. Only living beings can feel sensual values. And further, it seems the value of pleasure in diseased life is subordinated to the same value in healthy life, even when the intensity of pleasure is the same or even greater in diseased life. In other words, a physical pleasure felt by a healthy and vital person is clearly in some sense better, fuller, or more complete than the exact same degree of pleasure felt by a diseased person. To make this distinction more stark, on page 95, Shayla notes the feeling of euphoria that occurs in some forms of paralysis as part of the disease. He then asks, who among possible victims would envy a paralyzed being for its euphoria? Likewise, Shela maintains that vital values are founded on spiritual values, that is, values of knowledge, beauty, and moral goodness. Shela argues that life itself, or the vital value of the noble versus the vulgar, cannot be the highest value, for such an ordered scale of value ranks could only be accessible by spiritual or intellectual acts, acts that occur independent of vitality and not simply for its sake. On pages 95 to 96, Shayla remarks, Life simpliciter, that is, life itself, life simply, life simpliciter has a value apart from the differentiations among vital value qualities, only insofar as there are spiritual values and spiritual acts through which they are grasped. If values were relative to life alone, life itself would have no value. It would be a value in different being. It is only because spiritual values, acts, and contents exist that we can talk about relative height of values at all. The spiritual is therefore foundational to the value of the vital, and we can therefore know that vital values are higher than, say, values of pleasure and use, but definitely lower than spiritual values, knowledge, beauty, moral goodness. The fourth characteristic is depth of contentment, or the depth of the experience of fulfillment that sets in when one attains or realizes a value. The essential interconnection is, the higher the value, the deeper the contentment. Shayla says, the contentment in feeling one value is deeper than the contentment in feeling another value if the former proves to be independent of the latter, while the latter remains dependent on the former. In other words, to feel genuine contentment at the lower levels of value, you must also be contented at the higher levels, while on the other hand, you can feel genuine contentment at the higher levels, regardless of discontentment at the lower levels. To illustrate this, on pages 96 to 97, Shelley uses the following example. It is a quite peculiar phenomenon that sensuous enjoyment or harmlessly trivial delight, for example, attending a party or going for a walk, will bring us full contentment only when we feel content in the more central sphere of our life, where everything is serious. It is only against this background of a deeper contentment that a fully content laughter can resound about the most trivial joys. Conversely, he says, if the more sensual sphere is not content, there arises a discontentment and a restless search for pleasure values that at once replace a full contentment in feeling the lower values concerned. One can even draw a conclusion from this. The many forms of hedonism always reveal a token of discontentment with regard to higher values. This is, I think, wonderful insight. The fifth, final, and most fundamental essential property which varies with value height is the relativity or absoluteness of the value. Higher values are nearer to absolute, while lower values are more relative. Relative to what? Relative to a being's particular nature. For example, Shayla says that for a being without physical senses, there would be no sensual values. The value of pleasure or the agreeable just wouldn't exist for it. This would be akin to the way that colors wouldn't exist for someone born completely blind. Likewise, vital values are relative to living beings in general. But Shayla holds that absolute values exist in pure feeling or preferring or loving, as he says on page 
98, they exist in a type of these acts that are independent of the nature of sensibility and of life as such. So for example, the way we encounter aesthetic, moral and epistemic values is independent of our being particular beings with a particular nature. This is in the very essence of the experience. If I experience a pleasure or pain, I experience it relative to my body, and focusing on it, I also focus on my body. But the experiences of beauty, moral goodness, the cognition of truth, these take me out of myself. Focusing on any aspect of myself tends to pull me out of the experience rather than enhance it. I am focused outward, upon something other, something absolute, that just is, regardless of me. Both the values and the acts that apprehend them are given as absolute, or at least close to absolute, as not dependent on the particular constitution of my being. Sheila holds that all of the other four essential properties are grounded in this one. The absoluteness of a value is why it is given as enduring, indivisible, foundational in regard to other values and providing the deepest contentment. Likewise, the relativity of a value accounts for its variability in all these other ways, its being transient, divisible, founded on other values and giving but shallow contentment. But remember, although these characteristics are grounded in relativity or absoluteness, the height of a value doesn't consist in this. Value height can only be intuited directly through the acts of preferring and placing after. What I have been outlining is only the essential interconnections that value height height has with other essential properties. Knowing these explicitly can help us to apprehend values more clearly by guiding our attention and helping us avoid deception, but it cannot substitute for the intuition by which we know the value and its height directly. So to summarize, we can say there is a fundamental essential interconnection between lower values and their being more relative, and between higher values and their being more absolute. And with that, here is the hierarchy of values. Technically, it's a hierarchy of value modalities because its focus is on the broad basic groupings or systems of values. It does not delineate all the specific individual values and the interrelations found within each of these broad levels. A lot of this hierarchy will have been apparent from the discussion of properties associated with value height. Just glancing at it reveals a certain order. The different levels correspond to different levels or aspects of our being, from the physical level of our senses, to the deeper and more general level of our life or vitality, to the even deeper level of our spirit, mind or psyche, and then at last, the very core of our being, that part that relates to the holy. At the bottom are the sensual values, ranging from the positive value of the agreeable to the negative value of the disagreeable. These values pertain to the senses, and this value modality is relative to sensible feeling. Only beings with senses can experience them. When the agreeable is felt, this is pleasure. When the disagreeable is felt, this is pain. These are not the only sensual values or feelings, of course. Within each modality, there are a wealth of different specific values and corresponding feelings covering every shade of value experience. This hierarchy simply gives the main ones, which can be seen as, in some sense, including the others within them. As mentioned previously, sensual values are extensive, inherently involved with space. They appear in material goods that typically must be divided to be shared and are felt in specific parts of the body. Although different things may be agreeable or disagreeable to different people or different species, and what is highly disagreeable for one species may be highly agreeable for another, nevertheless the distinction between agreeable and disagreeable is absolute. Whatever is given as agreeable is preferred to what is given as disagreeable, all other things being equal. No one prefers the disagreeable as disagreeable. Though sometimes we may choose the disagreeable over the agreeable for the sake of a positive value from a higher modality, such as submitting to a painful operation to restore our health, or foregoing the pleasures of food during a religious fast out of devotion to the holy. Illustrations of Shaler's hierarchy often feature a level below sensual values, called the values of the useful. As mentioned previously, the essence of the useful is to bring about the agreeable. 
On page 103, Scheler distinguishes between what he calls self-values and consecutive values. Self-values are those which retain their value character independent of all other values, whereas consecutive values, by essence, possess a phenomenal, intuitively feelable, relatedness to other values which is necessary for their being values. This is to be distinguished again from merely being a means because intellectually identifiable as a cause of something else. A consecutive value has to be given as a value, though a value whose essence it is to serve another value. The value of a tool is a perfect example of this. A tool immediately presents itself to us as something useful. When listing the value modalities, Shaler doesn't devote a section to the useful. It is not a self-value like the rest, so I haven't included it in my illustration of the hierarchy, as that could be misleading. The consecutive value of the useful serves the self-value of the agreeable. The agreeable is an end in itself, even though there are still higher ends as we ascend the hierarchy. And there are other kinds of consecutive values too, serving different self-values. The next highest modality is that of vital values. These pertain to the quality of life and range from the positive value of the noble to the negative value of the vulgar. This value modality is therefore relative to living beings. Only living beings can experience vital values. The language of noble versus vulgar is perhaps a little inexact. Here the noble means the excellent, as we might say a noble horse or a noble tree, as well as a noble person. The idea is of a living being, full of vitality, being all that it can and should be as a living being. It should therefore conjure ideas of strength, courage, health, power, fruitful striving, the vulgar, of course, is the opposite of all these. The weak, cowardly, sickly, impotent, and so on. There are many feelings and emotional reactions associated with this modality. Scheller notes a few on pages 106 to 107. The feelings of quickening and declining life. The feelings of health and illness. Of aging and oncoming death. Of weakness and strength. A certain kind of being glad or sad about something courage, anxiety, vengeful impulses, anger, and there are many more, both specific values and the feelings that correspond to them within this modality. We cannot even indicate, he remarks, the tremendous richness of these value qualities and their correlates. On page 107, Scheler insists that vital values form an entirely original modality, and that they cannot be reduced down to sensual values, nor reduced up to spiritual values. The vitally noble is not the same as the sensually agreeable. The man who primarily pursues and possesses vital nobility is very different from the man who primarily pursues and possesses the sensually agreeable. The latter is likely to be a hedonist, the former to have a lot of control over his sensual desires. Likewise, vital values, because they are relative to living beings, because attending to them draws our attention to our own sense of life, are not the same as spiritual values, which are free from this reference to a particular kind of being. And vital values are felt in the body, though generally with the whole of the lived body, rather than highly specific areas, as with sensual feelings. This brings us to the next highest value modality, the val modality of spiritual values. Spiritual here, stemming from the German word Geist, means mental, intellectual, and spiritual in our sense. Some other illustrations of the hierarchy use a different term, like mental, intellectual, or psychic in the sense of psychological, but I've decided to keep the term used in the translation. It gives a sense of the transcendent nature of these values, which is certainly what Scheler intended. As with all the modalities, there are many different and highly specific spiritual values, but whereas the specific values of each of the other modalities can be grouped within the range from one general positive value to one general negative value, Scheler proposes three main types of spiritual values. First, we have the aesthetic values, 
ranging from the positive value of the beautiful to the negative value of the ugly. Then we have the moral values, ranging from the positive value of the morally right to the negative value of the morally wrong. Here Shaler reminds us that does not mean correct or incorrect with reference to some abstract law, like Kant's categorical imperative, but refers to non-formal values that can actually be experienced. We have an immediate sense of what is right and wrong even if we are not applying any kind of formal rule. Finally, we have what Scheler calls on page 108 the values of the pure cognition of truth. Why not just say the values of true and false? Scheler holds that truth itself is not a value. On page 189 he explains it is rather an idea distinct from all values which is fulfilled when the meaning content of a judgment formulated in a proposition coincides with the facts of a state of affairs and when this coincidence is itself given in evidence. But the knowledge of truth on the other hand is a value. It is important, worthwhile, enriching and so forth. Likewise, the searching for truth is a value. Shaler states that the pure cognition of truth is sought primarily in philosophy as opposed to natural science which he believes is instead aimed at controlling nature. This makes the values of science subordinate to the values of philosophy. The principal feeling states associated with this modality are spiritual joy and sorrow. What distinguishes these from other forms of enjoyment and suffering is that they appear without mediation. As discussed previously, they are not relative to a particular kind of being. The sense of my lived body is not required in order to experience them, and they do not participate in extension, either in specific parts of my body or vaguely throughout it. They also vary independently of variations on the lower levels. For example, we can still experience spiritual joy while at the same time experiencing physical pain or vital weakness. There are a number of other emotional states or reactions belonging to this modality. Shaler names the following. Pleasing and displeasing, approving and disapproving, respect and disrespect, spiritual sympathy with others, and the desire for just retribution, as opposed to vengeful impulses which belong to the vital modality. At the very top of the hierarchy are the values of the holy and the unholy. Due to its very nature it is somewhat mysterious and is perhaps the most difficult modality to talk about. On page 108 Shaler says that it forms a unit of value qualities not subject to further definition. Nevertheless these values have one very definite condition of their givenness. They appear only in objects that are given an intention as absolute objects. He goes on to note that this does not mean that there are some class of objects we can define as absolute but rather that these values pertain to any object given in the absolute sphere. Many different things can be given as holy, depending on culture and religion. What's crucial is that there is a definite experience, a way that these are presented to our awareness that unites them all. They are given to us as absolute, as being of utmost ultimate significance and totally independent of our particular being. I have therefore chosen to call the values of this modality absolute values. Shaler neglects to name them, referring only to the values of the holy and the unholy. Other illustrations of the hierarchy either follow him in this, or employ a term like transcendent or sacred. Shaler believed that the value of the holy ultimately pertains to persons, however the person or persons may be conceived. In other words, at the heart of the value of the holy is God or at least, gods. The holiness of all images, symbols, sacraments, rituals, and so forth, all participate in and are grounded upon this self-value of the holy, the divine person. On page 109, Shaler says that this is so because the act through which we originally apprehend the value of the holy is an act of a specific kind of love whose value direction precedes and determines all pictorial representations and concepts of holy objects. Shaler has a fascinating philosophy of love, which would be too much to get into in this video, but to put it simply, for Shaler, love is a special kind of act 
that moves towards new, higher, as yet unrealized values in another person. It is distinct from the act of preferring because it moves ahead of it. When you love someone, you see the best of them, not only what they actually are right now, but what they have the inherent potential to be. Shayla held that it is the love of a divine person that fundamentally opens up the value of the holy to our awareness. At least, this is what he held in his Christian period when he was writing his book on material value ethics. The feeling states associated with this modality range from blissfulness to despair. Shayla says, in a certain sense these feeling states indicate the nearness or the remoteness of the divine in experience. These are the most absolute of experiences, the least relative. They are not an experience that one seems to have, but that one seems to be. On page 343, Shayla says that the light or darkness of these feelings appears to bathe everything given in the inner world and the outer world in these acts. Within these experiences, they do not appear to depend on anything. Whatever may have led to them, they appear to go beyond this and to not be about anything in particular. Shayla remarks that, just as in despair, there lies at the core of our personal existence and world an emotional no, so also in bliss at the deepest level of the feeling of happiness, there lies an emotional yes. Thus concludes my explanation of Shayla's hierarchy of the value modalities. This is really just an overview. There is much more in his book, so I'd highly recommend reading it. I find Shayla's approach to value, and especially the hierarchy, really helpful because it acknowledges all values, though without pretending that they are all on the same level or simply relative to individual inclination. There is a clear order among values, as our own experience attests, even though there is also a great diversity among them. Shayla's hierarchy acknowledges all levels of our being, but acknowledges them as levels in a hierarchical ordering. He is not saying to suppress or ignore or somehow remove the lower levels, though he is saying the higher are more important. As living beings with bodies, the vital and sensual values are appropriate to us. It is right to pursue and enjoy them, so long as they don't obstruct the pursuit and enjoyment of higher values. Of course, in reality, it's not so easy to know how to rightly balance the pursuit of different values. It may be that a truly right balance is possible, though difficult. However, it may also be that a perfect balance, satisfactory in all respects, is simply not possible, that there are tensions among values and levels of value that cannot be resolved. For instance, it could be that the holy makes demands that are unacceptable in light of the morally right or that moral rectitude demands action that would undermine vital excellence or life itself, or that pursuit of even a basic degree of the noble and agreeable leaves too much, too little time for the spiritual values to which we are also called. This all seems true to life. Yes, there are many different values. Yes, there is an order among them, or at least among their broad categories, and yet there are tensions conflicts, compromises. My final conclusion then is that I find Shaler's material value ethics remarkably true to life. 